So the UN SDG Summit is underway, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Summit uh, in here in 2023. Uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, the Secretary General, has called the nations to come together for this summit to uh, ultimately uh, re-energize and, um, and rescue, really, uh, I think is the term he used, uh, the plan to get these 17 Sustainable Development Goals back on track and completed uh, or in place by 2030. Uh, I, I don't know that completed is is uh, is really the goal so much as at least they're in place so that we can, as a global community, uh, make the world a better place for for everybody, a much more equitable kind of a place. Um, uh, it's worth noting here, even as we kind of get started, that uh, throughout the discussions, um, not just here at the UN now, but anytime these discussions tend to come up, uh, there's always a sort of moral undertow to it. There's uh, um, a sense of of the rightness of the cause to do this. And uh, I would even admit that, you know, a number of these goals and and what they, at least on the surface, purport to be shooting for uh, are good things. The idea of providing education and people having access to health care and that kind of thing, in the most basic general sense, uh, can be seen as a good thing and maybe even sort of uh, have a, a moral imperative to it. However, um, and that, of course, I'm, I'm being intentionally, for the sake of time, simplistic. I mean, we could easily go into what kind of education we're talking about, what kind of approach to healthcare, and uh, what kind of, uh, you know, maybe um, requirements would be involved in in those kinds of things. Those those are real concerns and conversations in their own right. But just the idea of making sure kids can go to school and get an education, like, you know, these things certainly ring of a very moral kind of a thing. But what I really want to get to in that regard is that there is a putting forth of a moral imperative to accomplish these things, but nobody stops and asks, what is the foundation of that moral call? Like, what what morality are we drawing from in this? And that becomes very, very evident, the, the, the disparity between what you and I as believers, followers of Jesus, Bible-believing Christians, those with a biblical worldview— uh, and the uh, and those who hold a different morality, in particular the one that seems to be kind of behind the globalized UN initiatives, um, the disparity between those two becomes evident as you listen more closely to the kinds of things that are being described as uh, appropriate goals to seek and to go after. And so, uh, what I've done today is as sort of a um, you know the conference is not over yet, and there's going to be discussions going on all week, even beyond you know sort of the um, you know, the slated 18th and 19th. Um, discussions will continue on through the week. Um, so, I mean, this is relatively early, but uh, we'll, I'm guessing we may speak to it again later on in the week too. But but so far, at least, uh, this is kind of a, uh, a look at some of the things that have been covered here. And I'm kind of drawing um, significantly from, uh, dis, uh, from speeches given by uh, Antonio Guterres, who's the UN Secretary General at the moment, and um, and some of his speeches, of which I've put links to, that you can listen to some of these things yourself. Uh, and I will warn you, some of them get a little tedious. Um, there's one in particular that's a link to a three-hour sort of opening to the whole uh, gathering that has all kinds of sort of protocol, kinds of naming of documents, and it just, it you know, it gets a little tiresome. But as you scroll through into the various discussions, it really does become kind of interesting as you make your way through. But anyway, um, uh, those are there for your consideration. But anyway, so there are myriad existential challenges uh, that, that the UN is seeking to address uh, in this meeting. Um, of course, you would imagine poverty is one of the sustainable development goals is to address poverty on a global level and make life more equitable for everybody. Uh, the idea of Russia's war with Ukraine, of course, was a major theme um, and the need for that conflict to end for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that there are grains and foods and supplies and stuff that both of these nations provide on a global scale uh, that, that, that needs to be, um, that, that is reason to bring this conflict to an end, that those things might flow freely once again. Um, of course, you know, there's mention of the pandemics and how do we approach it in a forward, uh, you know, going ahead, uh, forward-looking kind of a way. Um, by the way, each of these things in and of their own right um, has been discussed many, many times in, in much larger, long-form discussion uh, by folks that are principals in, in, uh, you know, in the UN and that kind of thing. Um, here, uh, they are moving quickly through a lot of these things just to open the discussion, and then I would imagine what is happening, and I think what's been reported is happening, is that there's all kinds of meetings taking place outside of the main sessions. Um, of course, climate change was a big one. 
Um, and by the way, I don't mean to just blow through pandemic and how uh, that might be addressed. We will talk about that kind of thing uh, at a later point, but a um, uh, later time. But uh, climate change and the green agenda was a major uh, focus um, in uh, in discussions here. Uh, the idea of climate loss and damage, which is sort of a fund that is uh, that there is an expectation of all nations, uh, especially developed nations, quote unquote, to pour funds into this so that those nations that are underdeveloped and are victims of climate change, which is caused by developed nations, are supposed to put funds in here to sort of balance that out and, and sort of begin to solve that inequity. Uh, that was talked about. Um, and by the way, uh, this group of topics that I've mentioned already, uh, it's worth pointing out that these things are specifically heavily financially uh, figuring into this whole discussion. Now, originally, when I was putting this post together, I was going to call it Follow the Money, because um, the discussions that are going on here are revolving in large part, and many of the discussions, not all of them, but many of the discussions, and certainly some of the early discussions. Matter of fact, in that large three-hour video, at about the hour 40 minute, uh, or about an hour and 30 minutes in, a panel discussion takes place, kind of a forum among four folks, including um, the uh, current um, president, I think, of the World Bank. And uh, in that conversation, he lays out priorities for his tenure and that kind of thing. And it becomes very obvious that this discussion focuses a lot about the importance of nations that are highly developed having sort of a moral obligation to pour money into less developed nations. Now, as a believer, by the way, I should interject this because uh, as a believer, um, you know, I see the rightness of helping people, right? We all do, right? Jesus said, it's, uh, spoke often about the idea of, of providing practical help and that kind of thing. That's not a foreign idea to a Christian. Uh, as a matter of fact, throughout history, you know, many, 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 if not most of the medical missions and hospitals being built and all those kinds of things, education being provided, that was often done by, by way of Christian missionaries, bringing the gospel and, and bringing you know, as it were, a cup of cold water uh, as, a, as a means of helping those in physical need, but also as an entranceway then for the spiritual need to be met too in terms of really helping people to come into a right relationship with God in Christ. Um, in other words, a believer has a very clear foundational um, uh, well, basis by which to provide both physical help and, even more importantly, eternal help and that kind of thing. So there's a consistency about the foundation from which we start. That, again, will stand in stark contrast to a very different foundation of morality that, that is uh, undergirded by uh, nations that, uh, a globalized system of nations that all in themselves, many of them have very different foundations for their version of morality, but somehow they're all putting much of that aside for the sake of a global unity. Well, that automatically becomes somewhat cynical because we're essentially saying that that which we would say is the most important thing is in their minds a far lesser important thing because there is a moral imperative provided from a secular standpoint that is intended to provide the umbrella for all other moralities to come under. It's a very important distinction to recognize regarding the difference between a UN's moral idea uh, toward health and poverty and education, those kinds of things, and where a believer, a, a person with a biblical worldview, a, a follower of Jesus would come from to provide those things as well. Um, and so don't get caught up in sort of their version of that kind of thing. Recognize that it's fundamentally different. We did a post uh, a few years ago called um, Your Kingdom Come versus the Great Reset. Um, and, and in that, we discussed the idea of, or we discussed the difference between what the kingdom of God is really about, you know, the idea of, of, of even the millennial kingdom when it comes, and how that is different from the utopian pursuits of the globalized population under the auspices of groups like the UN or, uh, or, or, or the World Economic Forum in, in, uh, in serving and moving toward um, you know, an agenda known as the Great Reset. We're not hearing that term very much anymore, so I'm fully expecting there to be uh, either another terminology that begins to emerge or, 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 or the, the term great, uh, 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 great Reset is just sort of taking a back seat to what really is probably going to be the front-facing uh, vehicle through which these uh, these these goals are ultimately reached, and that would be through the UN. I, I would imagine. I mean, that can change, but that would be my guess, um, based on what I can see now. But anyway, these first things: poverty, uh, Russia's war with Ukraine, the pandemic, 
Uh, it's certainly climate change and the green agenda where the goal is to get rid of coal and fossil fuels and work on quote-unquote renewable sources of energy and that kind of thing. These are things that will require massive amounts of money to change. This is not something you just all of a sudden decide and now we're not processing coal anymore. Now we're not working on, uh, we're not using fossil fuels anymore. We're now using some other thing like electricity. Well, electricity is powered by coal processing and, and natural resources and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, there's 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 no quick way to get to that kind of thing in the first place. And whatever path is taken to get there, it's going to require massive amounts of money, which would require nations with massive amounts of money to be the ones to pour into that pursuit. Now, I mention that because the end game, you'll remember, in Revelation 13 uh, is about a one world government that is um, that encapsulates both politics and economics. There's a mark of the beast that uh, in Revelation 13 speaks of that is not only, um, it's, it's really twofold, I should say. It, on the, most of us tend to think of it uh, for one of the obvious things that it mentions. You cannot buy or sell without taking this mark on your right hand or forehead. So that speaks of economics, right? But also it's, it connects with politics. Uh, because you really can't separate politics and economics when you're talking about governance. And so there is a, there is a clear sense that without the uh, take of the mark, you can't buy or sell. Well, that means that the global economic system has fallen under the auspices of some kind of a political system that's made that decision. Now, we know that that's going to be the government that is led by the Antichrist. Um, but it not, only, uh, it not only provides a political and economic uh, it touches on politics and economics. It also touch, touches on morality, religion. Uh, the other part of the mark of the beast is that it is a it is a a mark of allegiance where you are bending the knee to the antichrist. In fact, if you read Revelation thirteen, why don't we take a look at it for a moment here? Um, you know, it's uh, folks that tune in. I. I love to presume that we that we have a sense of understanding what these things are that I'm talking about, but I shouldn't really presume that. So why don't we take a look at it here? Now, um, the first half of chapter 13 speaks about the Antichrist, one who has risen to power among a group of nations. Uh, there's an attempt on his life that seems to, or maybe does, literally uh, kill him, but he, again, either seems to or literally does rise from the dead. And so he is seen as someone who is supernatural, that the world is so blown away by that they are, you know, who can make war with the beast? Who's like him and that kind of thing? Uh, they won't be calling him the beast very likely. Chances are he'll, whatever his title will be. But in the second half of chapter 13, there's mention of another beast, a second beast, or someone that we know as the false prophet, who is a religious leader who comes alongside the Antichrist, who's already seen as a Messiah type of person. Uh, remember, the word Antichrist uh, doesn't just speak of against, but someone who is like or somebody who is definitely opposed to, but can appear very similar to. And so he will be embraced as a Messiah figure. Um, but alongside of him will be this additional religious leader, someone called a false prophet, who will call upon the world to create an image uh, of the beast, an image of the Antichrist, that, um, and, and here's where I'll just go ahead and, and draw your attention to the text. This is starting in verse 11 now. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth uh, to make an image uh, to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, this actually came up in our prophecy conference over the weekend. A question arose, um, actually that was emailed in. 
Um, should we try to figure out who the Antichrist is based on the 666? And attempts have been made through history. Was it uh, uh, Caesar Nero? Uh, was it, you know, it's, uh, all these attempts have been made. I don't think that's really the intention that we would know that, well, those at the time that the Antichrist comes on the scene may be able to determine who that is based on that, but they'll also be able to determine it by everything else that came before in chapter 13. Uh, a world leader, Paul talks about him in 2 Thessalonians 2, who goes into the temple of God declaring himself to be God and demanding to be worshipped above all that is called God. He'll cause the offerings and sacrifices to cease uh, midway through this seven-year period of time that uh, that will um, uh, mark the last seven years of human history prior to Christ's return. We see this in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Um, uh, he will be very much like the Caesars of old and will require to be worshipped, uh, himself to be worshipped and that kind of thing. So getting back to where, our, where we're going here, this Mark of the Beast in Revelation uh, chapter 13, uh, verses um, uh, verse 16, 17, um, and 18, uh, is is not only an economic uh, entrance way into that economic uh, global political system, but it's also it's also an act of worship. It is an act of ob- obedience and, and, and obeisance. Even it's uh, uh, it's a call to worship, even as the term says here. Uh, and so, um, this leader and this system will be both political, economic, and religious. He will likely be brought about. Uh, through like you know the green movement and climate change and all these things that will sort of a uh, an existential threat that in, that involves the whole world and that may become the vehicle by which the world is ultimately brought together. Uh, we that seems to be what it looks like right now, and we'll see what it ultimately ends up to be when when that time comes. But um, um, now I you know I, I love to interject at this point that by the time Antichrist actually comes on the scene and is identified as Antichrist. Uh, We know he'll be the Antichrist by virtue of signing a seven-year, forgive me, actually a lot of you guys corrected me, and and, uh, I know this, but I always catch myself saying signing the agreement. Uh, He will confirm a covenant with the many, uh, Daniel 9.27, and I've got this bad habit of saying signing all the time. He may or may not sign it, but at the very least, he will confirm it. He will acknowledge it. It will be strengthened by virtue of his um, uh, his being involved in it or giving full-throated endorsement to it or something to that effect. But the seven-year covenant will be marked by his involvement in it, and that will begin the seven-year period known as the tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week. I will uh, encourage you to read Daniel verses uh, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. I won't take the time to break it all down here because we're already uh, looking to go a little long. But uh, read that, and if you want to look up any of our previous posts that deal with that, you can do so. But just enough for now to say that that last seven-year period of time will uh, begin with the Antichrist's confirming of that covenant. Again, confirming of that covenant. Forgive me again for always saying signed. Uh, But it will culminate in the return of Christ, Revelation 19.11, where he returns with the armies of heaven. Uh, Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, says we will come with him when he returns in glory. Um, uh, Jude speaks of uh, he comes with ten thousands of his saints to you know to deal with the ungodly and such. So that will bring an end to the seventieth week of Daniel, and ultimately, uh, a short time after that, we'll see the establishing of the millennial kingdom. So, um, but this mark of the beast will encompass politics, economics, and religion, or at least a moral system of some kind. Although I don't hesitate to call it a religion because. Uh, it is. It does very openly involve worship. It openly involves the supernatural. It openly involves truth claims. Uh, it openly involves people's worship and all that kind of thing. And so um, we don't want to assume that even though there seems to be a very secular foundation behind much of the thinking in the world today, that the world under the time of Antichrist will be a secular world. It won't be. It will be a religious, supernatural time but it just won't be true. It won't be based on the truth uh, of Christ. And so, but anyway, so Revelation 13 gives us an understanding of what that will look like. And this discussion really, as we look at what's going on in the UN and that kind of thing, this this is a discussion to help us kind of get a sense, once again, as we, as we often point out, of how it is we get from here to there. Uh, how do we find ourselves ending up in a world that ultimately is led by Antichrist? Now, I don't know if I actually said what I 
always like to say just a minute ago, but I think the church will be gone prior to the Antichrist revealing. Uh, that I will speak to for just a second. Um, uh, actually, a friend of mine at, at church brought it up over the weekend, and, and I've got an email recently on it, and I often hear comments like this or read comments like this in the comments section on our YouTube channel in regard to holding a pre-tribulational perspective. Now, this is not going to be all about a pre-trib perspective, but I just want to speak to the question that arises pretty often when I mention that. Um, you know, what happens if we're still here and the Antichrist comes on the scene and it turns out not to be pre-trib? What will happen to your faith then? Well, my answer to that is nothing. My faith isn't built on the time of the rapture. My faith is built on the finished work of Christ and where I'll be for all eternity because of his grace toward me and that kind of thing. My hope and my reading of the scripture lead me, and by the way, in reverse order, my reading of the scripture and therefore my hope is built on the idea that that we're not appointed to wrath and that God's wrath begins with the breaking of the first seal as no part of the tribulation period begins until Jesus breaks that seal. So who's really responsible for that? Now, that may sound simple, but I think it is that simple. Uh, I think that there's arguments to be made for other perspectives, but to me, both explicitly in the teaching of Scripture, but I would even argue there's implicit examples and types and such that would seem to bear this out as well. So I hold that position. Now, does that mean I should withhold that position? Because if it turns out not to be pre-trib, everybody who believes in Jesus is suddenly going to fall into apostasy because I guess it's not true. I would sure hope not. I mean, if that is if that is your perspective on things, if, if it turns out that it's not pre-trib, that suddenly your whole faith is shattered, then your faith is in the wrong thing. Your faith is always to be in the finished work of Christ. And whatever he calls us to, he calls us to when we serve him in that, as we make our way toward that day when he does finally call us home, whenever that is. But we don't avoid teaching from Scripture because, well, what if it's different? Well, you could say that to lots of doctrinal positions on things. You could say that to lots of different ideas in Scripture, um, you know, that that are as yet not fully realized. And so, uh, you know, I don't hesitate to to speak in my pre-tribulation perspective. Uh, Antecedent is a hopeful thing. As a matter of fact, I I would anchor, and this was a big part of our conference over the weekend is the idea of the encouragement that comes from recognizing that Jesus will, in fact, uh, uh, snatch us up, you know, uh, will be snatched up, as, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air um, prior. And this is a separate event from the second coming when we return with him uh, at that point when he touches down on the earth. And so uh, anyway, but again, not, not to make this all about pre-trib, but uh, I just, as I mentioned, I thought, well, maybe I should address that real quick too. But anyway, getting back on track here with the UN, um, we're covering a few topics here uh, today, apparently. Uh, some other issues that were uh, very, very, uh, uh, that were mentioned along the way more than once. Uh, and this is where we begin to see sort of the morality uh, stepping off point that we want to recognize. Um, in, in Antonio Guterres's, uh, one of his speeches, uh, at least one that I've heard, you may have mentioned others too, I've not heard all of the discussions yet. Um, but uh, on to after all the discussions or, you know, in the midst of the discussions on climate change and all the different things, he also mentioned the idea of, of the curtailing of women's reproductive rights as well as gay and trans rights as part of the 17 uh, UN SDGs. Now, when we say women's reproductive rights, he's talking about abortion. Abortion is wrong. It takes a life and that shouldn't be just sort of sort of cleaned up to make it sound like it's just some medical procedure, like, you know, you're having your tonsils removed or something. And so when we talk about curtailing of women's reproductive rights, what we're talking about is murdering children, and we're taking away a person's freedom to do that. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure we understand that when there, even though there is a moral underpinning that's, that comes a, a moral sounding underpinning that is coming from the mouths of these in the UN and, and, and other and anyone else who holds that view, by the way, that that morality that they're speaking of sounds right to them, but it is not right. God has said what is right. And when we decide to take a moral position, a quote unquote moral position um, that differs from what God has to say, it is immoral. And so no longer is, 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 uh, can we as believers listen to these things and think this is just all wonderful stuff that you know, they're going to make life great for everybody. 
they're coming from a fundamentally different place than a, than a Bible-believing, Jesus-following person is. And we want to make sure when we're hearing these speeches that those things aren't just sort of floating by like they're intended to. Uh, when he says women's reproductive rights, he's not saying abortion necessarily. He's not talking about taking the life of a child uh, or anything like that, because that would stop us in our tracks and make us stop and think, okay, well, abortion's a hot button word, but women's reproductive rights sounds kind of nice. Well, yeah, who'd want to keep someone from, you know, having health care and that kind of thing, right? And how we uh, that tends to be associated. But when those things are said, it gives us an indication to where their hearts really are, what their sense of morality is really based on and where it is even coming from. Uh, when it comes to murdering children, that is something that is right in Satan's playbook. We see that throughout Scripture. Rachel's children, we see uh, yeah, as a reference to those who were, you know, uh, who were killed under Herod when Christ was born. Uh, the spirit of the age, kind of driving that uh, kind of thing. And so, um, you know, don't don't you you know make sure when you're listening and watching these things, or you're hearing discussions on these things, and you hear these kinds of terms. Our ears need to be up. We need to be paying attention so we don't just sort of nod our heads and go along and say, well, that sounds nice. If you don't know what it means, then it does sound nice. But if you know what it means, it sounds hypocritical and abhorrent. And But that is the basis of their moral framework from which they're coming. And that's an important thing to recognize. Um, even something else like migration policies, which he also mentioned, the idea of... Um, of uh, there needs to be a more humanitarian approach that lines up with the United Nations Charter uh, when it comes to migration policy and that kind of thing. Now, I'm not going to get on a migration thing either because I have mixed feelings about some elements of this kind of thing. I am, as a citizen of heaven and a citizen of the United States, I have a tension within me on certain fronts in this discussion, I will be honest with you. Um, you know, my basic general thinking on this is that I think as a government policy, the idea of having borders is a necessary thing for a state. But as a Christian, if someone illegal came to my door and they were starving, I'd give them food, right? I mean, that's just simplistic, but, but you know, that's the tension that we deal with as believers. Um, but setting, setting aside that tension, the idea of migration policies that are more humanitarian and more globalized i.e. in line with UN charter policies and that kind of thing, it is a subtle push toward a globalized agenda. The idea of a borderless society where we all take care of each other. Now, this naturally follows when the goal is not equality, but equity. Equality is when everybody has the same opportunity and they do what they will with it. The outcome is undetermined until you take advantage of or don't. Equity means we're going to make sure that and do our best to make sure that everybody's on a level playing field. It is communism. It is it is uh, it is sort of a stated goal of the socialized mindset that undergirds most of this kind of discussion at the UN and other organizations that are tied in with the UN. Certainly, it's the World Economic Forum's desire to, to sort of reach a world that is equitable and no longer has shareholders but stakeholders and all that kind of thing. Um, so. Now, again, I know that these are hot-button things I've just talked about, and I'm, I'm not giving them their due time, but they're, they're all topics that are worthy of their own thing. But I'm just making the point that the agenda behind the UN's desire is, in fact, globalization, um, and it is an enormous organization with 193 member nations. In other words, most all of the nations of the world. What is there, 206 nations or something right now in the world? So you've got like 97% of the countries of the world on or whatever it would add up to be uh, that are part of the UN. Some are more full-throatedly in endorsement than others, but these member states make up almost the entire global population. And this is where the UN wants the world to go. As a matter of fact, um, in some of these discussions, uh, that mention of the UN as, as sort of the the spearhead of the globalized world government came out uh, in one place was when there was discussion about AI, which was described rightfully so, I think, as a great cause for uh, awe, but also fear, because AI that runs amok could potentially create real problems globally for, for human beings. Um, uh, and, you know, whether or not it would become like uh, Skynet or whatever, you know, the Terminator or some kind of thing, I, I don't know if that would be a real possibility or not, but who knows? But at the very least, AI can become uh, a tremendous threat because it has the capacity to alter the way we think about things. 
to present things in such a way as to undermine our capacity to think for ourselves or to even determine whether or not something that's being told to us is true, false, right or wrong, what it leads to, any of those kind of things. A great example of this um, from a spiritual standpoint is, of course, you know, the AI Jesus. You know, um, uh, some months ago there was a church service that was held by an AI avatar uh, in Germany, in Nuremberg, I think, as I recall. And uh, now there's an AI Jesus who sort of says things that sound like what Jesus would say. Well, hold on a second. The way we know what Jesus would say is by reading the scripture, okay? Then we know what he actually did say. Um, And this AI Jesus, on the other hand, becomes sort of this, um, you know, man-centric kind of version that is not God, but is just sort of this algorithm, this program kind of thing. Uh, You know, this AI-induced, artificially intelligent uh, intelligence undergirded avatar who quote unquote looks like Jesus or the, our, our idea of who Jesus is. We don't, we don't know what Jesus looked like and he certainly doesn't look like typically what Jesus in our artwork looks like. Um, being a Middle Eastern man, right? Uh, as, as God incarnate, he took on a body of flesh that was Middle Eastern. He was Jewish, right? Um, so most of our artwork doesn't look like that. Not only that, but in, in presenting an AI Jesus, we are presenting an avatar that is satisfying a certain spiritual need. And there is sort of this sense that, well, Jesus is like right. So we should, you know, whether or not they, people believe he's God or really know anything about him, there's sort of this cultural sense that Jesus is good. And so here's this AI version of him that tells me things that kind of line up with what I want to hear uh, and that kind of thing. So we've diminished people's view of who Jesus actually is. And here's now again, another counterfeit Christ. Jesus said to be careful of counterfeit Christ, right? And Matthew 24 is one of the premier focal points of, of the recognition of the last days. Um, and so, uh, but in that discussion about AI and misinformation and disinformation that could potentially be disseminated, uh, notice here how there's this sort of uh, faux concern about legitimate, uh, uh, you know, legitimizing mis and disinformation. Um, what they mean by that, and this bears itself out when you realize how much information has been curtailed that turned out not to be misinformation, what they mean by that is the information that they're putting forward as being right and stuff that goes against that narrative being wrong. And so their concern is that AI could, you know, on the one hand, it appears like they are worried AI might mislead people. But what that is ultimately going to be used for, I think, I think what this will be used for uh, is a little bit more nefarious. I I feel as though the seeming concern over that And this is where Antonio Guterres actually begins to very openly speak of globalization and the idea of an entity existing to sort of manage global things. Uh, This came up in this discussion. Um, uh, Let me see. I think I should put down here. Um, Here we go. In in regarding uh, AI and data harvesting and, and the need for greater regulation, since tech companies and even governments are far from finding solutions... Uh, quote unquote, and this is me now, uh, I think it really causes us to to wonder, you know, as I was watching it, I kind of jotted some notes down. And I thought, well, you know, I have to imagine that what we're leading toward is a call to some kind of globalized government or overseeing body of some kind to sort of regulate AI and data harvesting so that it's not just tech companies managing or governments, but some super government that ultimately becomes the arbiter of these things, uh, the the custodian of these things. Well, sure enough, as he went on, he uh, spoke of some calling for a global entity on AI and actually openly said he was going to create a UN board to help serve toward that end. So AI now becomes an open channel through which, or an open path through which, a globalized entity can be put in place to oversee the, um, the regulating of AI. In other words, he and he said, tech companies and even governments are not capable, uh, or is how did he put it? Um, uh, or actually, this was something else. I'll come back to that. But but he did say that um, since tech companies and even governments really can't deal with this, there ought to be some kind of a globalized entity that is set up to regulate AI. Uh, 
Um, now that sounds good to people who don't know where that's going. We just read about it in Revelation 13. This is where we're going with that. And this becomes now again a pathway toward accomplishing that, toward getting to that place. Um, now going on a little bit, I'll come to what I was about to say here in a second. Um, uh, among Guterres's, uh, um, um views uh, in regard to the multinational, uh, multipolar, multilateral differences and workings together um, that, uh, that he was describing in the course of his speeches, um, he talked about the importance of, um, or he talked, he lauded the, the UN's ability to work in a way that other nations, as he put it, and this is what I was going to say a second ago, it was a different discussion, but um, he talked, he lauded the UN's ability to solve a problem where other nations either wouldn't or couldn't. On uh, this particular thing, there was the potential, uh, there was the need to move oil from one place to another, and the UN's action and will to act on this prevent, you know, save the Red Sea is the way he put it. Uh, and so, um, but he talked about the UN in, ter- in such glowing terms as being that entity that could do things that other nations couldn't or wouldn't. Why? Because as a shared community, a joined community of 193 nations, uh, the will of that globalized community can now deal with problems that individual nations can't. Now, let me at this point interject something that Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum had uh, uh, is, is on a big move toward and has been now for a few years, um, probably longer, but he's been openly speaking about this much in the last couple of years, is the importance of reestablishing trust in government um, and, and also government working alongside of the business sector to solve problems that are too big for any one, either government or business, to handle. Well, now move that into sort of the next framework, like, again, at the UN, suddenly now the UN is a global entity, a government that is seeking to bring together the resources of of multinational corporations and those kinds of things to ultimately find the best way to provide benefit for all of the global community, for, for the common good. The idea of a globalization of our world is not just a pipe dream from decades ago, or even all the way back to Genesis 10, um, but it is a reality that is taking shape every day. These UN uh, meetings, you know, there are those that look at this and say, well, who, who can really figure out what's going on? Okay, well, um, the impact and effect, and in concert with what the Bible says the world's going to look like prior to Christ's return, would demand of us that we do not ignorantly go through life unaware of what's happening. To what degree you want to look into it or not is entirely up to you, but to sort of assume that this stuff really doesn't matter, uh, I think is to adopt a mindset that will ultimately uh, prove to be to your own hurt. Uh, When Jesus indicted the Pharisees and the religious leaders for not recognizing the signs of the times of his first coming, Uh, That was a strong indictment against them. They should have known better, is what Jesus was saying. I don't see any reason to think that he would not say the same thing of his children today, uh, his followers today, the father's children, right? But our followers of Christ today who don't recognize the signs of the times of his second coming. Uh, Now, I take the scriptures first and foremost at face value. When Revelation 13 talks about a supernatural seeming uh, world leader who's got a religious partner alongside of him who's also supernatural, uh, where he comes back from the dead, or at least appears to come back from the dead, if not literally, I mean, if he didn't actually die, he may have at least to the world appeared to die, Uh, but he comes back and the world worships him. Paul talks about this. John talks about it here. Jesus talks about uh, elements of this in, in Matthew 24. These descriptions are, are not, there's no reason to see these things as allegorical. Um, there's no reason not to take them at face value. They paint a picture of a period of time that is yet future to us, but is given to us in detail enough where we can acknowledge and recognize this is what we should expect things to look like. When we take a look at what's going on in, in meetings like the SDG Summit, 
for next year's future summit that they're going to have, or uh, the World Economic Forum's Davos meetings every year. Um, when we consider, or when we when we follow up on what's going on at the World Health Organization, or or the International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank, and we see how they're working together, uh, when we follow things having to do with any of these um, these these entities, or the or the outreach of of their arms into the various elements of of global cultures and societies and finance and government and and environment and all these different things. We're we're trying to get a sense of how we get from where we are to what the Bible is talking about. Now, granted, um, we don't we can't speak with absolute certainty of 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 every step of the way to that. But at the same time, it's impossible to imagine that the Bible would talk about these things in such a way, and for us to see what's going on around us today, and not at least stop and go, huh. That really does. I don't have to imagine anything to see this. Look, this is a lot like that. And it should at least catch our attention. Um, and so that, that's, that's why we, we post these things. Um, I'm not trying to be dogmatic and say, okay, this is this. But I think that we would be unwise to be unaware of what's going on around us. Um, and of course, as, as followers of Christ, we are looking forward to seeing him. We are looking forward to the day that he comes for us. We are looking forward to the day when we can be in his presence, you know, not, not just to get out of a world that's falling apart, um, but because we love him. You know, if these are indicators that the bridegroom is getting ready to come get his bride, we ought to be excited about that. Just like uh, a literal bride would be looking forward to her bridegroom coming. And I'll, I will finish with this. Look at this. I'm going to close my laptop here with my notes. I'm really going to close on this. I'm not going to lie and say that and then come back and close with something else. Um, but the example of the, of the, of the bridegroom and the bride, the, the Jewish wedding uh, preliminaries, the idea of, of coming to get the bride, was, in, uh, was uh, an illustration that Jesus himself spoke of in, uh, in his own ministry. He talked about in John 14. Matter of fact, turn there with me if you would. John chapter 14. Um, now, I don't think that the disciples would have really understood the concept of the rapture. I don't think that would have been anywhere on their radar. Remember, Paul talks about that as a mystery. Behold, we'll all be changed, right? The idea in 1 Corinthians 15. But in, in chapter 14 of John's gospel, he does, you know, from our perspective, now having Paul's writings and seeing the picture more openly uh, given to us by the Holy Spirit in Scripture, we can see in this what Jesus is saying here. Uh, uh, there's an added dimension that we now can see that at the time he said it, he would have known, but the disciples likely wouldn't have picked up on this necessarily at that time until later. Uh, verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. And of course, the discussion opens up, and Jesus, of course, says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, in their minds, they likely were just thinking about him one day returning, you know, or coming to establish his kingdom, or something like that. At this point, they weren't even sure, they, they, they didn't even understand the idea of the crucifixion, the resurrection. This was all, a lot of what this was, like, just not clicking yet. But we can see in this now, you know, with the inside of the rest, have, uh, having the rest of the New Testament, we can see that Jesus is using here the idea of the wedding analogy. Uh, like a bridegroom, he is going back to his father's house to continue to build on that house a place for his bride, like they would have in those days. And it becomes the responsibility of the father to look at that dwelling that's being built, uh, and, and when it's time... And it's ready, the call goes forth for the son to go get his bride. And he goes and gets her to bring him, to bring her to be back with him. And that's that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's giving that illustration as a type. Now, again, they would not have thought of the rapture, but you and I certainly can. The idea of the bridegroom coming to get his bride uh, with the fanfare and trumpets, um, we see this. Uh, this same illustration in Genesis 22 and 24, um, with uh, you know when Abraham sends a uh, sends a 
uh, a helper, Eliezer, the helper, to go find a bride for his son Isaac. Uh, he goes and he lavishes uh, gifts upon this, this young woman. She agrees to go with him, ultimately, to marry a, a, a groom who she's never seen before, but all she has is the indicators that the helper has given her about him. Uh, her family tries to hold her back, but she ultimately goes. She chooses to go ahead and go with him. When they're on the way back, Isaac sees her coming. He goes and collects her and brings her back to his, to his tent, and they consummate the marriage. There's this beautiful picture in this whole thing um, of being caught away and that sort of thing. This is what we look forward to, and it's not just because the world is falling apart. It's not, it's not just to avoid the judgment that we're not called to, right? The idea is that we're not appointed to God's wrath upon the earth. Jesus took that wrath upon himself. So it's another reason why we can't be here while those things are going on. Um, uh, we want to be with him because it's him we want to be with, right? We, we want to say goodbye to this because we want to say hello to him and be there in his presence. We want to go home and enjoy the marriage supper and, and, uh, and be with him for all eternity. I mean, it's, it's out of a love for Jesus that we look forward to these things. And we look at what's going on around us because it helps us get a sense of how we're getting closer Every day, the bride was waiting for her bridegroom. She was preparing herself. It's even said that she would go to sleep oftentimes in her wedding dress in the, in the hope that he might come in the night and she'd be ready to go. Um, that's, that's the anticipation that is rooted in love. I can't wait to be with my beloved. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I want him to come and get me because I want to be there with him. And so um, that's what motivates me to look at these things. That's uh, Those are not only some of the examples in scripture, but also uh, the fuel for my hope that we will we'll see him coming uh, in a pre-tribulation perspective and in that kind of a time frame, which means he could come at any moment. Um, uh, again, she, the bride never knew when the bridegroom was going to come. It was all a matter of when the house was ready and, and he could come get her. So that could happen at any time, you know? And so I just, I, I live with a regular sense of expectancy. And once again, if it turns out it's not, if it, if it, um, if all of a sudden the Antichrist shows up on the scene and we're here for another uh, bit of time while this stuff unfolds, I just still want to see him all the more. It's like my hope's not in the timing of the rapture. My hope's in being with my bridegroom. And that hope is not a uh, something that I have doubts about. It's something I'm certain of. The timing of it is something that I feel like I'm pretty sure how it's going to work out. But if not, the goal is not that I get out of here before things get rough, or not even rough, but before judgment comes. The goal is that I am with him and in his timing He'll come and get me, and he'll come and get us as a church. So um, anyway, I really do appreciate you watching and listening and, um, and such, and I do hope that you find these videos helpful, uh, uh, or at least prodding uh, some, some things to think about and to maybe get into your, your, your Bible and, and do some research. And again, I'll put some posts, uh, some links uh, uh, under there as well for you to pay some attention to and to watch and to catch some of the UN speeches and that kind of thing. Again, the, the discussion is going to go on the rest of today and even into the week as meetings continue. So that being said, um, um, again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Father, we do thank you and praise you for all of your goodness and grace. We're so grateful for um, just uh, the fact that you would send your son to pay our debt, that we might be free, forgiven, and just uh, free of the penalty and punishment that our sins so richly deserve. But yet instead, you have so richly poured out your grace upon us. We thank you that one day we'll be in your presence forever. And, uh, and we just look forward to the day when Jesus comes to collect us as his bride and to bring us home. In the meantime, Father, help us to have our hands on the plow as we, uh, and the gospel on our lips, uh, eternity on our hearts and, and uh, before our eyes, uh, living every day with a sense of real priority of, of walking with Jesus and, 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 and helping people to come to know him and come to a life-saving relationship, an eternity-altering relationship with him as well. We do again thank you for being so good to us, and we pray that, Father, in these days as we see these things unfold, that we would um, just find ourselves all the more excited that our bridegroom is coming. So thank you, Father. We love you and praise you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.